Hey guys, what is up? Welcome back to Roots and Refuge Farm. If you're new here, my name is Jess. I'm so glad you're here. If you're not new here, I'm also really glad you're here. I'm sitting on my front porch and I have a mess of dried peas here that I have been just plugging away at the last few days. Um, every time I can sit down for five or ten minutes, I'll sit down and shell a little bit. And I started shelling this evening. Decided to go grab my camera and just have a chat with you guys. A chat over shelling peas has got to be one of the best things imaginable, don't you think? I, I love shelling peas with my friends. I get my kids out here shelling with me. And I love being able to just turn the camera on and chat with you guys. Since I started my podcast, I've not done nearly as many of this type of video where I just sit down and talk because obviously I'm talking a lot on the podcast. Which, by the way, I'm really proud of the podcast. If you're not listening to that yet, I will put a link down below to where you can find on my website, like the sum summary of all the different episodes. But it's up wherever you listen to podcasts on like Spotify or Apple or iHeartRadio. Um, I know for a lot of people, podcasts are hard because they're very visual. I like listening to podcasts while I work in my garden. I like putting headphones on and listening. And that's kind of always been my intention when I make videos like this because I know that those of us who are into this lifestyle, we often have our hands busy and our minds free. And this is the kind of content that I most value in those kinds of situations. So today I want to talk to you a little bit about turning your waiting room into a classroom. This is something that I've said for a very long time now. It originated for me when I was deeply longing for a farm. It was not within the realm of possibility for us to make that happen. We just didn't have the money to go buy a property and begin developing it. We were living in a rent house in town, um, a house that my dad owned that he rented to us for a really good deal so we could afford it. Gosh, I just was obsessed with homesteading and I don't know exactly when that started for me. When I was a really young child, I always wanted to have a farm and I would say I want to be a farmer when I grow up. And then of course, my second son Asher had food allergies. That really drove me, I think, to realizing that our food system was broken. Uh, I started reading labels for the first time as a young mother with a baby who had such a severe milk allergy that if I ate so much as a bite of yogurt or cheese or something and then was nursing him that he would be in pain and there's nothing like your child in pain to motivate a mom to uh to make a change so i became very aware of our broken food system which led of course to the localization of food and i will be completely frank i didn't just like snap up a go-getter attitude and start turning my waiting room into a classroom. In fact, I lamented and felt sorry for myself for years that I couldn't do more, that I couldn't do what I wanted. I tried to garden on a small scale, failed miserably multiple times, had a lot of gardening failures before I ever had gardening success. Uh, but eventually, I kind of realized that if I ever was going to get a farm that I needed to know what to do with it. I needed to know how to do the things that I was dreaming of doing. So I started, of course, borrowing all the books that they had at the library. This was, I mean, 15-ish years ago. There wasn't YouTube the way there is now. There wasn't a bunch of people creating content in the homesteading world. There were a handful of bloggers and I dove very deeply into their blogs, read everything that I could. I would read the books at, from the library. I would go sit in bookstores and read the books so I couldn't afford to buy them. And I learned everything that I could while I was waiting. I think I, I could have learned more had I had the mindset to really embrace that posture of like turning your waiting room into a classroom. I think I could have been better prepared when we started our farm, but it wasn't until we started and I realized how valuable the information that I had gained was that I really started telling people, hey, don't just sit and wait. Toast is here for her moment in the spotlight. Toast. <laughs> so, uh, I started to tell people, don't just wait for the fulfillment. Start preparing yourself to actually receive it. I've got to move the cat. 
So that's kind of what I wanted to bring up today and kind of give you some ideas of things that you can do. And now Chips the cat is here. <laughs> They're all about attention. I sit on the front porch every morning and drink my coffee and the cats join me. So uh, I wouldn't be surprised if all five of them don't end up over here before we're done with this video. So yeah, I, I just wanted to give you some ideas of things that you can do right now. So I, I'm going to speak to you as if you are a person who desires to have a homestead but cannot like fully jump off into that yet. There are a couple of things that I think are fantastic places to start. And I think that if you learn to apply these while you're waiting, not only could it potentially help you get to the homestead sooner, um, it's gonna help you know what to do with it once you get there. Uh, the first thing, which was my like doorway into homesteading skills, is using the kitchen. When you start growing your homestead food, it's not going to come in a box with instructions telling you which cans to open. It's going to come in raw ingredients that you are going to have to know what to do with. And in fact, it's going to come sometimes in raw ingredients that come in a whole lot at the same time where you're going to be overwhelmed with harvest. So not only do you need to know how to cook these things, you need to know how to preserve them. I personally feel like that is the best place for anybody to start. Uh, maybe you already bought your land. Maybe you're living in a camper on your land. Maybe you're living in an apartment waiting to go out to your land. Maybe you cannot afford to buy land and you're living with your mom. I don't know what the situation is, but if you have access in any regard to a kitchen, you can start honing your homesteading skills. You do not have to go to a farmer's market. I know a lot of people will say, well, go buy stuff at the farmer's market. That's great. If you can support local farmers, that's wonderful. But if you can't, go buy stuff at the grocery store and learn how to cook from it. Um, and know that once you grow the food yourself, it's probably going to taste better, but you can learn on the grocery store food. Uh, one thing that I used to do whenever I was turning my waiting room into a classroom is I became friends with produce managers at grocery stores and I would find out what they did with produce that was about to go bad. Um, now, some people are not gonna be super friendly and helpful, but you never know. All you need is one. And so talking to produce managers and saying, hey, if you ever have excess of stuff that is gonna go bad and you're gonna mark it down, will you let me know? Like. It doesn't always work that way, especially in big chains, but if you have any local grocery stores where you just have an individual that's working there that you can talk to, you can actually get some deals. I ended up, there were multiple times I ended up with like whole flats of berries or tomatoes or whatever, and that's how I would learn to can things. Um, I foraged. I had a friend that had some land and would take me out and let me pick wild blackberries. And that was the first time I ever canned anything was jam that didn't set. And so we used it as sauce, <laughs> blackberry sauce. It, that's how I learned was with what I could get for free or cheap. If you are looking for a deal and on bulk because you're wanting to learn how to preserve, another option if you've got one close to you is a chef store. So we have the one here in Columbia, South Carolina. It's about probably like a 45 minute drive from my house, but it's called the US Food Chef Store and I know they're all over and there are other stores like that. You don't have to have a business ID. You can go in and buy bulk food like uh, restaurants do. And it's a great thing to go look for markdowns, but also just large amounts of something if you want to learn how to preserve. But I would encourage you to learn how to preserve. I would encourage you if you're like looking through seed catalogs and so wishing that you could grow a big garden, what appeals to you? Um, if you're looking at all those tomatoes, what are you going to do with all those tomatoes? Do you know how to make really good salsa? Do you know how to make spaghetti sauce? Do you know how to do those things? Like learn right now. Just go buy the tomatoes at the store and learn. So that whenever you do get your first big harvest, however long that takes, you're not going to waste it making mistakes. Learn now on grocery store produce. And then cooking, obviously cooking from scratch is a really big valuable skill that if you are wanting to homestead, you're going to cook. People are in such different places when it comes to eating out and restaurants, fast food, and where they stand on that. That's something that I know a lot of homesteaders really still struggle with is just like breaking the habit of fast food. And they have great food at home, but they haven't developed the discipline of using it. 
And I mean, it's something that I've struggled with, having a whole lot of kids and just the overwhelming busy life. Now, you can learn how to cook fast things now before you have the crushing weight of a big garden and a dairy cow and homestead chores. You can, can get your habits in order before you have the pressure of daily life that really would benefit from those habits being in order. Another thing along that line, I mean, learning how to cook is a big thing and maybe you just need to challenge yourself to say, I'm going to cook three meals a week or I'm going to stop going and getting McDonald's for lunch. I'm going to start meal prepping where I can make something and pack my lunch or whatever it is. I don't know where you are and what challenge you need to make. Maybe you need to look at a few things that you're currently buying that you think I can make that from scratch and think along the lines of what it is that you're hoping to have. So you really can be preparing for that. Like if you want to own a dairy cow, maybe uh, stop buying coffee creamer. I did a video some months ago called Eat Real Food that talks about learning to like step away from processed, heavily processed foods. And coffee creamer is so easy to make. You just take half and half and you can put some maple syrup in it to taste, some vanilla extract, or you can get other flavored extracts, and you just do a little bit and just taste it as you go until you get to the preference that you like. And then you're not buying the International Delights or whatever coffee creamer it is at the store. I know those things taste good. I know that they're very, like people get really, they get real habitual about their coffee creamer, but a lot of times they have vegetable oils and all these different things in them that are not the best for your body and it's so easy to sub that out with something that one day when you have a cow you're gonna have lots of cream and it's crazy that we can get so in a rut with our habits that address that now so that whenever you go to the store once you have a cow you don't habitually keep buying that oil-based coffee creamer prepare your life to fit with the homestead life. Uh, prepare your habits to fit with that. Speaking of habits, one of the biggest things that I think anybody could do to turn their waiting room into a classroom, this is a big one and it's hard and it takes a while, is learning to eat seasonally. So this one messed me up when I first started because I did not I mean, it just did not occur to me, I'll just speak really frankly, it did not occur to me that all that food in the grocery store really didn't naturally grow anywhere nearby throughout the year. In fact, when I first started 15 years ago being like, I want to be more aware of food, I remember I used to go to this farmer's market and uh, it was in... You're good. Sorry. You're fine. Oh, I had a panic moment. I stopped my camera because Jackson walked out and then for a second I thought maybe I hadn't been recording at all. <laughs> We're good. This one thing that was sort of a light bulb moment to me 15 years ago, however many it was, I guess it would have been a little longer than that. I always liked going to farmer's markets even before it became such a priority to me, but um, I was at this farmer's market in Little Rock, Arkansas when I don't even know that Asher was born yet, but when Jackson was really little, sev several years ago, and I remember going and this guy bought, selling citrus, and citrus does not grow in Little Rock, Arkansas. It was obviously, it was just a produce vendor. Like a lot of times at farmer's markets, if they're not certified local farmer's markets, it's just somebody buying produce the same way a grocery store buys produce. It's just shipped. And uh, this guy set up at the market, and I remember going over and looking, and this man came up and he asked the guy, he's like, you got any local tomatoes? And the guy said something and no. And then the, the older man was mumbling under his breath about how messed up it is that these people come hawking their shipped stuff. We, we want from the farmer's market, we want local, local stuff. And I was sitting there next to him and it just hadn't occurred to me that that citrus could not have possibly been local citrus. I, I just, I didn't know, I was ignorant to it. I would say learning to eat seasonally was one of my very early lessons that I learned. I read a book, and this is a great classroom book, by Barbara Kingsolver called Animal Vegetable Miracle. I read it when it first came out, and that book was hugely eye-opening to me as a young consumer that had a romantic idea of farm life, had a desire for it, but didn't really have any conviction behind it. And when I read her book about 
essentially the, it's about the localization of food and self-sufficiency and community sufficiency really um i don't think she uses those words but it's really the gist of it <clears throat> and it made me see how much i was dependent on the grocery store and in being so dependent on the grocery store how uh, prone i was maybe to like habits that were not conducive to the homesteading life and i started just like buying asparagus when it was in season in the spring and i noticed wow it's so much cheaper when you buy it when it's actually in season and things typically do taste better when they're in season because they're not having to be shipped for far off they're not having to be picked unripe or and i started realizing that even the store-bought tomatoes which i later came to know do taste like disappointment but even the store-bought tomatoes that you buy in the summer when tomatoes are actually growing somewhat locally taste very different than the store-bought tomatoes that you buy in the dead of winter and I realized that I really wanted to eat more seasonally so I could eat more locally so I could experience food um, at a higher quality and, and more like what it's meant to be now of course we grow it now and that gives a whole new level the idea of eating seasonally and locally because something that's growing out of my yard is just gonna be far superior it's gonna be better for the earth. But I have come to adore seasonal eating for the appreciation that it evokes in me. Um, for instance, people ask me all the time, are you gonna to try to heat a high tunnel so that you can grow tomatoes over winter? And no, I'm not. I'm gonna to anticipate tomatoes over winter and I'm gonna thoroughly enjoy them in the summer where they're at their prime. I will eat my fill and of course I'll make salsas and um, I'll put things up to eat out of season, but it's still not going to be as good. I mean, like, even canned salsa, while it's great, it's still different than eating a fresh tomato hot off the vine, putting salt on it in the garden. I love seasonal eating because it evokes appreciation in me. It, it you know, absence makes the heart grow fonder. It makes the very cyclical nature of the homesteading life better that's something that i think is is kind of somewhat counter to our society and to our culture is that with a homestead when you're saying i'm going to live a homestead life you're going to forsake conveniences in a lot of ways and you're going to do the same things over and over and in a society that's always about the new and the latest and the greatest finding convenience wherever you can it's very countercultural to like adopt those mindsets so for me seasonal eating is a matter of like spicing things up it's a matter of having anticipation and fulfillment that you deny yourself part of the time by saying i'm not going to eat tomatoes when they're out of season i don't it's funny because i'll go like if we're traveling for something we'll tra be traveling for an event and we'll be the winner and i'll order something and i'll say no tomatoes and somebody will look at me and be like wait a second i thought you were like the tomato queen don't you love tomatoes and i'm like oh no i i love tomatoes too much to, uh, <laughs> to cheat on them like that <laughs> <laughs> I want the real deal. And, you know, speaking of mindsets, but in turning your waiting room into a classroom, learning to embrace slower, harder, handmade, from scratch, and essentially denying yourself conveniences when necessary. That's a big part of the homesteading life. And that's something that you can absolutely learn to adopt while you wait. Maybe you don't have your farm yet learning to do things by hand learning to make from scratch what you can might not be everything sometimes it's not gonna make sense you know like i've shown you guys before how to make butter that really only makes any financial sense if you have a cow um, or if you have access somehow to copious amounts of cream at a good price because if you were going to buy heavy cream at the store it's so expensive that it would make your butter astronomically priced if you were trying to do that now for the novelty occasionally it's fun or if you have a special meal that you're wanting to do something really cool for sure you know like buy cream and make butter but there are other things that can save you a lot of money by making from scratch bread for instance i mean making bread is a huge money saving thing especially if you compare it to like breads like if you were to buy a these insects are wild. Um, 
if you were to buy a loaf of like locally baked bread with high quality ingredients at the store, I mean, it'd be several dollars versus making one at home for less than a buck worth of ingredients. So I really think that embracing inconvenient when necessary, um, it makes you appreciate the conveniences when you have them rather than just relying on them to survive. But I think it puts you in a better mindset to tackle the homestead life because that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to be countercultural. We're trying to regain independence and forgotten skills and have healthier bodies and healthier minds and overall more peace. And I'm afraid that essentially the microwave approach to life that is our current society's standard it's, I don't think that that's good for our bodies or our hearts or our minds um, or necessarily our peace. Now, I'm, I'm all for conveniences where they really help, but I think being mindful overall makes it better. And in the waiting, you can definitely learn to approach things going for quality and experience and fulfillment versus just going for convenience. So one time Jeremiah and I were doing a podcast and we were talking about like what to learn while you wait. And Jeremiah's answer really took me by surprise and it showed that, you know, we just have very different roles in our partnership. Jeremiah said that he felt like something people could do while they wait that was most helpful is to learn to build things and learn to repair things. And that I thought was really interesting. See, I would never have come to that conclusion because since I've been homesteading, I've had Jeremiah and he knows how to build things. Now, he didn't always. He learned a lot of what he learned just on the fly out of necessity. When it comes to getting anything done, you're either gonna spend your own time and the sweat of your brow or you're gonna spend your money. And when we started, we certainly didn't have any money. So there was a lot of the sweat of our brows and a lot of the time that went in. And we grew a lot of skills. So. There are some really cool things that you can do. Anna White is a website that has building plans and you can build furniture. Um, learning to make repairs, YouTubing things and learning how to work on things. Uh, a homestead, not everybody who does homesteading is handy. I've seen that more people who are not handy who are actively homesteading do have money to spend um, and they hire out their work more. But if you are going to be trying to do things yourself, there's no reason why you can't start doing DIY projects and, and learning those skills now. And the last thing, no, it's not the last thing. I could just list so many different things and this could be an extremely long video. I'm trying to talk about the most important things. All right, let me throw this one in. Herbal medicine and herbal remedies, overall detoxifying your life, that's kind of in line with the homesteading lifestyle because we are looking for a holistic experience of life being healthy again this can lead to more resources I mean like a lot of times herbal remedies can be a lot cheaper it can support your health and I mean I think that learning to use like herbal medicine especially if it's herbs that you could grow in the future you're really preparing yourself to use what you're gonna have but overall, I think it's just a really lovely approach. One of my favorite resources for herbalism um, on just like a beginner level, my friend Kaylee, she has a channel called The Honeystead. Uh, she is an herbalist, she's brilliant. She shares a lot of really great information. Um, I would highly suggest her. Along with that, when we're talking about like mindsets, and I know I talked about conveniences, um, resourcefulness, that is something that you can absolutely learn early and begin implementing. And I'd said earlier that, you know, some skills can help you get to your homestead sooner. Uh, homesteading is finding your place at home in so many ways and like having a home centered life. Now, for many people, you know, you're always going to work off the farm. You're not looking to like bring your job home. A lot of people are looking to bring their job home. I am learning right now in the season I am in with the businesses that we're opening. I'm learning to balance being off the farm more for the first time in a very long time, which has been, it's been hard. I give props to those of you who are carrying on full-time jobs off your farm and still managing homesteading because it's a lot. But resourcefulness, it empowers you. Um, when you need less, you have to 
make less. You have to provide less whenever you're able to live on less. And for me, I would say that thrifting and um, shopping secondhand and using repurposed materials was a huge step in one, getting the homestead, but also really being able to embrace the lifestyle. And I'm still very much about that. So learning, um, again, making things from scratch, that kind of goes into being resourceful. A lot of times like denying the conveniences in order to have a healthier, higher quality and cheaper product that goes into being resourceful, but also shopping secondhand, um, repurposing and, and essentially just engaging with the world and with the resources of the world as if they're not all disposable. I think that in our current society, we have very unfortunately been, I mean, it's just sort of this throwaway stance on everything. Oh, just get a new one. And I don't think that should necessarily ever really be our approach. Now, building community. I would say that is something that you do not have to wait to have a homestead to do. You could go further into this as far as connecting with other farmers. I, I hesitate to really put a lot on that because I think for a lot of people, the idea of going and asking somebody if they can help is overwhelming. And then if they don't get a good response, I mean, a lot of times farmers will say no because they're just trying to get their job done. Um, and that can be really discouraging. So maybe if you ever find yourself in an opportunity of being able to help someone on their farm to find a mentor, that's awesome. I mean, take the opportunity up. If you cannot find an opportunity like that, don't let it deter you you know, continue to turn your waiting room into a classroom even if you do not see that you have an evident in-person teacher. There are enough people making information out there that can teach you, if not directly. Um, building community with other people who are getting into gardening, even if you're just gardening in containers. Um, building community with other people who are cooking from scratch and locally sourcing food uh, who are homesteaders. There are so many Facebook groups like I know there's one here in South Carolina that's South Carolina like small farms and homesteading or something like that. There are Facebook groups that you can get on and connect with other people. Not everybody's going to be your best friend. Not everybody's going to have resources and ability to help you or need your help. But even if you can find one solid like-minded person that you can connect with in this dream, it's so valuable. And I remember when the homesteading dream was a very isolating thing. It was like that for a while for us. Um, we would tell people what we wanted to do and they were like, oh, that's cute. You know, it was just very dismissive. It was not nearly validated. Of course, I'm surrounded by validation now, but it wasn't always like that and it's very isolating. Finding a community is huge and then eventually you're going to need it because homesteading without a community is a thousand times harder than homesteading with a handful of other people who are homesteading too. Having people that you can get together with, that you can learn from, that you can butcher chickens with and, and share plant starts with, that can be there whenever your cucumbers fail to bring you a bucket of their cucumbers and that you can share your excess with, it's huge and you don't like I said, you don't have to wait till you have a farm to begin making those connections. You just have to put yourself out there. And while it is hard to be vulnerable, it's always worth it. So I am quickly running out of light. As you can hear the, the evening chorus of wild things. I did get quite a few peas shelled here. Look at that. I know that doesn't look like much, but this is slow, tedious, and wonderful work. I hope this helps you guys. I hope it gets your wheels turning. I know for many of you who've been here for very long, it's just repetition of things I've said before, but I'll keep saying them because I think that right now while we're watching people come out of cities and droves and like decide to pursue the homesteading life, it's very important that those of us who have been doing it are encouraging, uh, that we encourage this desire in people and that we give them the information that we're able to uh, so that hopefully they can have success and not feel that isolation. Thank you guys for hanging out with me today and all the days that you do. I bless you. Until next time.